I'm so glad after everything that we went through last week with the Islamic Jihad to have today in our studio, uh, Major General Gershon Cohen, retired IDF, an old friend of mine as well, uh, to talk about everything with. I think it's absolutely important. We did reservist. An active right, it's an active reservist in the IDF. I was just going to introduce you. You ruined everything. I was going to give this formal introduction, and then I was going to turn to you. But you no, know, all right. Anyway, thank you very much, Gershuk, for being here. So let's just start it off. Um, what 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 just happened last week? How are we supposed to understand Islamic Jihad? Supposed to be second tier, you know, little guy shoots off a thousand two hundred rockets, missiles. I mean, they even got to us in Gush Etzion. Um, last Friday, what is this? How are we supposed to look at this threat? What just happened? Uh, first of all, can you just sort of give me an explanation of what what just went on here? Actually, uh, something very important happened, and in order to analyze what the contribution of it to the security of Israel, we must, uh, in a way. Uh, get free from uh, all a uh, uh, well-known uh, cliches that mm-hmm. are really uh, evaporated everywhere. Uh, everyone just speaking again and again about uh, deterrence, about... Uh, uh, way. Yeah, I want to talk to you about deterrence also because it does. It, yeah, it's, it's become it's, a, a, me- a word with no meaning at this point. As it is, it, it, it's really... Uh, a concept that we must uh, make a kind of free framing right. and, and to put it in that new context. Okay, so before we do that, just explain what this secondary, not Hamas terror organization in Gaza when Tam- Hamas is a terror organization that controls Gaza. We begin with, uh, I listened to El Dulmot claimed how come that such a small organization, terrorist organization, uh, not important, can uh, lead uh, half of Israeli state to a siege for right. a, a week, a complete week. Mm-hmm. And another one from Mossad, the uh, retired Mossad senior person, David Maidan, wrote uh, in Facebook, uh, how comes that a young uh, Israeli state uh, Less than 20 years uh, since the uh, establishment succeeded in 67 to just uh, destroy three military well equipped organizations. And now we cannot uh, do the same with that small, what they called it in Hebrew, Kikyoni. Yeah, uh, sort of it's a, a straw organization. Yes, not- and uh, it is uh, absolutely a mistake to describe it like that. And I can even. Uh, in addition, must emphasize that they must uh, present this uh, small organization as almost nothing due to their uh, consistent, uh, uh, in a way, uh, consistent uh, dedication to bring Israel to another withdrawal. Because right. we are asking them, okay, look what happened with this uh, idea that uh, uh, we are giving uh, land, getting peace, how it was disconfirmed, all this approach, and we can just look what happened after this engagement and what is their uh, reaction to that. It is due to the uh, policy of Netanyahu that and uh, just strengthen them because actually they are small. And if we will just come back to be IDF of 67, then it is nothing. Okay, but wait. So it means that actually so what is it? What is it? It, what it is, is it? not at all a small threat. Right. It, what is it? What is and it? if you are trying to understand the Houthi in Yemen, for example, are they small threat? Not at all. They are a strategic threat to Saudi Arabia, to the whole uh, entrance to the Red Sea, right, uh, to the Arab Sea, mm-hmm. and they can launch uh, missiles uh, with long range, even coming to Israel. Right. They did yet not, but uh, they can threat Israel. They are part of the Iranian uh, complicated uh, threat that they built surrounding Israel. 
in the whole region. And an another very, very important point is that we must uh, look upon it uh, uh, with careful and careful uh, analysis and respect. They are absolutely religious. They are guided by religious motivation. We must look back to the inspiration of Abdallah Azam, uh, the one that led the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan. He was a teacher of uh, uh, Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. He was there before Bin Laden. Bin Laden joined them, him. And Abdallah Azam, why am I uh, taking him so seriously? Because he really created a revolution in the Islamic world. Uh, he succeeded to do what uh, Lawrence of Arabia tried to do and failed. Lawrence of Arabia tried to unite the whole Arab tribes uh, by just unification of their nationality. Actually, he failed. He, at the end of the First World War, all tribes back, uh, came back to just be single, isolated tribes, e each one with his own Although Arab yeah. nationalism played a very important role, yes, not so Lebanon and and in secular in nationalism, right? It was it failed. What Abdullah Azam? It it worked for a while. I mean, it worked in Egypt. It worked in Lebanon. Yes, but it second. failed in sixty-seven. You know. Okay. Abdullah Azam succeeded in Afghanistan to bring a uh, religious warriors from all a uh, Arab uh, Islamic. Uh, region, in Muslim, in, uh, including Indonesia, including North Africa, and they came not in order to struggle for their own home, for their own uh, local tribal interest, they came in order to join Jihad. Mm -hmm. And he himself was born in a village near Jenin, Silat al Khautia. In 67, he exiled to Jordan, participated with Fatah in the Black September against the king. And after that, he was a teacher in a university, a very... In Jordan. In Jordan, after several years that they realized how dangerous he is, they just threw him away and he went to Egypt, studied in an alzheimer with the Sheikh al-Qardawi, then he went to Saudi Arabia and also was uh, immediately detected as a threat, removed to Afghanistan. And his main idea was that there in Afghanistan, he's building the new conditions to... Uh, was this before or after the Soviet invasion in 1960? Yes, he was against the, the, the Soviet... But it was before... Was he in Afghanistan before the Soviet invasion? Or no, he came after just to react to that. Right, okay. So he built the Mujahideen. He built the Mujahideen. He built the idea of a new jihad, of a modern mm -hmm. jihad in the, in the modern uh, era. And uh, why, again, he is so important? Because he succeeded to... Abdallah Azam. Abdallah Azam. Right. Uh, to really bring back the idea of uh, uh, religious warriors dedicated to to save the Islamic world, to bring uh, the jihad uh, with all power, all what happened later with Al-Qaeda and ISIS, all that, we cannot explain them and understand them without that contribution of Abdallah Azam. He died there. He was uh, assassinated with his son. Yes, yet it is a question who really is responsible, maybe the Americans, yes, there are people uh, claiming the Israelis and maybe Bin Laden himself that wanted just to take his position. But his inspiration is very, very strong. And he always promised that what he succeeded to create there will be the key to come back to Palestine and to just succeed to destroy the Zionist. But Islamic Jihad itself it was established it. by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards in 1980, in 19, 1988. Yes, but uh, uh, the, the Iranian inspiration coming together with uh, 
jihadic uh, Sony because they actually succeeded to create a re a, a, a reestablishment of a new Islam. It means actually Jerusalem, El Quds, is more important than Mecca. So battalions of jihadic Islam are called the El Aqsa, not El Aqsa, El Quds battalions. And other are speaking about uh, Bet El Makdas, the Bet in the temple. Yeah. So they are all dedicated ju to Jerusalem. The Iranian are dedicated to Jerusalem. Right. Uh, Khomeini declared the last Friday of Ramadan to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And Jerusalem actually succeeding to unite the Sunnah and the Shia. It means that actually the radical Islamic warriors are united by just oriented to one main purpose, Jerusalem. But, okay, so one second. You're saying that the Houthis, who are against Saudi Arabia, I mean, they're against Mecca in that sense, they're, they're this Iranian satellite that's being used to, um, to threaten, to attack Saudi Arabia, and um, they're not, thinking so much about Jerusalem, at least not yet. You have the Saudis who, um, on the one hand, uh, object and reject the central place that Jerusalem is now taking at their expense against Me Mecca and Medina. And they were trying for, at least since the Arab Spring, to walk away from the whole Palestinian issue as a central unifying force of the Arab world, and they have been walking back. They don't support Muslim Brotherhood. They supported Israel against Hamas uh, in, in 2014 and subsequent years. But now they're trying to make a separate peace with Iran, mediated by the Chinese. You had a report yesterday that Bahrain, uh, which was one of the warmest members of the Abraham Accords because they're so threatened by Iran because they have a Shiite majority, um, that they actually are expunging all of the pro-Israel uh, uh, entries that they placed in their school curriculum after the signing of the Abraham Accords. The UAE also refuses to host Netanyahu uh, so far. Um, and so they're all trying to figure out, they're saying our interests may have changed. We don't trust the United States to protect us. We're making we're we're making inroads with Iran and try to then, cut a separate deal with them. So uh, of course, if we are just uh, analyzing the white paper uh, of a uh, White House, means a national uh, security document, yeah. uh, and the, uh, the way it was uh, just uh, presented in the Pentagon, because they made their own uh, paper according to the White House paper. The main uh, orientation of the United States oriented to China as a competitor, even regarding Russia, they are expecting the Ukrainian and NATO, the Europeans, uh, to succeed to overcome Russia by themselves with the United States support. And almost nothing uh, is concentrated about the Middle East. The only uh, emphasize regarding the Middle East that they are still still committed to the two-state solution. It means that actually they are declaring that they have any more no interest in the Middle East. Maybe they are thinking that they can keep it in stability as it is and they can just act beyond what's going on here and all what happened is due to the a sensitivity of Saudi Arabia, the Amorites, all these actors that they are getting the indication that they cannot trust the American involvement here in this region. So if we can really experience a kind of absence of the Americans, even though they are still acting in Syria a little bit, in North uh, Iraq, in uh, the ocean, uh, the Arab no uh, ocean, yet 
the Persian Gulf, yeah. Yes. Yet they are actually uh, in public declaration telling each one, uh, listen, you are on, uh, you are not in our, in our main interest. Okay, so let's go back for a second to the Islamic Jihad, where you have all of these, uh, your colleagues as uh, retired uh, generals from the IDF, sort of saying, well, okay, um, we suck, right? We, we weren't able to defeat Islamic Jihad, this, this, little, this little bug, you know, and uh, we were able to defeat all of the Arab armies in 67. This is pathetic. So then what is the Islamic Jihad? You're saying that it's, it's sort of the, the avant-garde of the Jihad. Why can't we beat it back? Still, why can't we beat it back? I mean, Netanyahu... We can uh, destroy them, but why don't we? in order to do that, uh, we must invade Gaza. Uh, we cannot really destroy them by uh, airstrike. The idea that we can do everything stand off uh, without boots on the ground is an idea that was well entrenched in Israeli approach in order to support the withdrawals. Right. The, the separation from the uh, Palestinians, and like we, we can really separate ourselves, uh, we cannot but separate I wanted to talk about that in a second, but I'm just saying, you know, Netanyahu always points to the surveys that show that the IDF is the eighth most powerful military in the world, or I saw another one last week, and that is the fourth largest, which is crazy, but whatever. I mean, so they give all of these bombastic proclamations about the power of the IDF, and we certainly are packing a punch, but we aren't defeating Hamas. We aren't defeating Islamic Jihad. We aren't defeating Hezbollah. We aren't, you know, we we won't even take an axe to the Palestinian Authority. As soon as we reached a ceasefire, the, we started resupplying uh, the terror state in Gaza. We, I mean, the first thing that happened yesterday morning, we're taping this on Monday, Sunday morning, you know, the ceasefire goes into effect, and the first thing Israel does is it allows fuel trucks into Gaza. It's, I mean, it's, it's no, automatically, and 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 Gazans are going to be allowed to work in Israel. Like, there's no. It just okay. goes on. In a really unique occasion, I think, in all history of human being, <laughs> because no, even one example in history that a group of people, we can call them a state, at least de facto, uh, creating a war against another state. And not only that, we are not making a siege against them. Well, all the I... electricity coming from Israel, all the water, a lot of the water, uh, economical uh, dependency absolutely upon Israel uh, with workers, uh, and money coming from Qatar, and this is also and the by US. permission of Israel. The oil coming from Israel, um, medical uh, means coming from Israel. And actually, there are word. actually in Gaza, people are celebrating more hours of electricity in day than in Beirut. Because of Israel. Because of Israel. And Benny Gantz wanted to give them electricity when he was defense minister, right? I mean, he said, oh, we have to help the Lebanese. We don't have any problem with the Lebanese, even though it's controlled by Iran. So it, it, and uh, uh, at the end, we are still accused by uh, keeping the Gaza people under a siege. This is abnormal in okay. all considerations. But all right. So what 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 we, what we just but see last only week? not just to criticize the government and criticize Netanyahu. I think he really achieved something. There. Important. What happened? Uh, what he achieved? If we are um, trying to judge him according to ordinary wars, he really not begin. To even to dream to achieve a, an absolute victory against Hamas and uh, this jihad in group. Not at all. What he really directed himself to achieve, and it is something quite important, is to really create the message that we have beyond a military potential. Actually, it was well presented, this extraordinary military potential with the 
uh, intelligence dominance and uh, a great uh, accuracy or precise uh, attack with precise ammunition. This was a, a well uh, done uh, action. The very, uh, deci very deep decision to just enter to this act is very important. Why? Because if we are looking upon an operation like Antebe, it is a story with a beginning and an absolute definite end. Right. Because and when they are succeeding, the troops to release the, uh, those who are captured, their, the hostages, yes, they are coming back and the day be after is nothing. The day right. after is uh, just it's, a party. Right. Here, by entering to that decision making, He's aware about the fact that he's entering to uncertainty. It is not just a risk management. It is beyond risk management because he cannot control the risk because he cannot really control uh, the chain of events, whether he beginning with this jihadic group and it will just immediately come to be another campaign with Hamas and maybe Hezbollah also joining, he cannot control that. The very fact that he was brave enough to enter to it, this is a great message. Beyond that, the decision that could be immediately judged by the opposition that maybe he is illegitimate to do it because maybe he's doing that only for a uh, political purposes. The fact that he got at the end the opposition support, he got it by declaration uh, by uh, Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz because they recognize that most of Israeli people supporting that decision of Netanyahu. So they just join it. They had no choice but to join it by supporting it. And that in itself is a huge message to tell them, if you already got the message that time is arrived to attack Israel, because according to the whole promises uh, analyzed by religious uh, prophets that this time 75 years of Israel is a time of opportunity and all what happened in the last three months with the protest and the uh, um, protest of pilots, maybe they will not uh, come to serve uh, as reservists. It was a message that the Israeli uh, capability to struggle, to be united in struggle, is still strong. Maybe think again whether at all it is your own time. Because we here we must come to understand the practical reasoning of religious people like Islamic uh, Jihad. In their practical reasoning, they are believing that God speaking to them in what's going on in reality. If reality presenting that makes them very realistic. I mean, I it's saw they are realistic. I saw I saw this uh, um, uh, newspaper headline. I think from 2014 that during during um, Protective Edge is that what it's called? Um, that that was um, in the Guardian, where was Hamas saying that God is protecting Israel? That God I, is I, I making it. right making their missiles miss their 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 targets or something like that so that and and on the one hand you could say that's crazy and everybody's laughing at them god is no but it's not because what they're it doing is, is it, they're recognizing reality and they're giving an easily understandable explanation to a, a phenomenon they're experiencing whereas in the in the west you have um you're seeing more and more and also in 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 the israeli left you're seeing that national strategy is largely being based on denying reality so that 
you know, you, you get things like, well, we're going to just pivot away oh, from, dusty. you know, from, from Iran or we're going to pivot no, away from like, what you say because they're not important because we don't want to deal with them. But, because but here we are opening a seminar, because, <laughs> really, because, and I wrote about that, whether at all they are rational or not, of course they are rational and they are alternative forms uh, to analyze rationality. Okay. For a Western people at the moment, they are uh, just getting the uh, feeling that their, uh, their enemy bringing God to calculation, immediately it is to judge him as irrational. What they cannot understand that rationality in this form of thinking is uh, combined together with the trust and the trust of God and the uh, uh, sensitivity to what's going on on reality. It means, uh, for example, the main question in Arabic asking at the morning, it means what's new, because the very, appro very deeply understanding of the whole cosmos is that every day is a new day. Every day, new conditions. Even the sun of yesterday is not the same sun of okay, today. So, so the, it means that by looking to reality, they can get a message from God. And if you are just facing a reality, that giving all messages, that you are facing a very strong Israeli uh, military capability, maybe if they are yet still united, maybe it is not your day. But here's the question. So they, uh, they are waiting to uh, to a message that here, just yeah, now, then they take your yes. opportunity. Well, I mean, there are a lot of contradictory messages that, we're, that we've been delivering to, to them. I mean, also, you know, on the last night, I think it was Saturday night, right, uh, you had these protesters in Palace in in Tel Aviv with with PLO flags you know I mean we're, it's like they they are, they are not at all beginning to understand uh, Islamic form of thinking and, and I can bet but wait I have a question first um so th a lot of the analysis like the very critical analysis of what just happened they say look you know we're attributing Hamas's non-intervention on behalf of jihad or Hezbollah's uh, non-intervention on behalf of, of of jihad as as a function of what we did. But maybe that's not true. Maybe this was a probe. Maybe what they wanted to do was test what our capabilities are, our responses, and also exhaust, at least to a limited exactly. degree, our stores of Iron Dome batteries so that you know, we got rid of exactly. X number. Like uh, Noah in his uh, uh, sheep uh, storing back the dog, if it right. is coming back or not. It means that the, uh, there's the, land or there the is The operation it. of uh, jihad was a, a kind of uh, a reconnaissance. Right. To say exactly. what's going on, what would be the reaction. So that, if that, 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 the action will be like... No, uh, not a probe that way that this was a softening operation, that they're going in, they're exhausting X uh, Iron Dome missiles with 1,200 missiles uh, from Islamic Jihad, which from their perspective is anyway disposable because who cares? And then the main force, after Israel has gotten rid of these missiles, and we don't know the United States, their stores are down, they can't resupply Ukraine fast <laughs> enough, they're not going to worry about us. We All of their emergency stores in Israel have gone. They're, they've all been got. They've all been taken to Ukraine. So we're going to get rid of them. The Israelis are going to sit back and say, "Look what a great m mission we just completed. We just accomplished." Um, and then, you know, on Jerusalem Day, on Thursday, we're going to attack. Okay. So, Absolutely. And uh, so that seems to be a counter interpretation of what you're saying, which is that they're looking and they're saying, "Geez, these Jews, they're they're actually serious. They're actually no, united." Both. You're right, and I am right. It means that okay, it it it, it is both. Hey, what what it means? It is both. Hey, again, we must. Every day we have to come back and prove yes. to them again that they shouldn't and, attack yeah, us. We, and... we cannot really understand the way. They are thinking in a kind of, that could be interpreted in our form of thinking as contradiction. For example, we can take Sheikh al-Qardawi, that after 9-11 was considered to be personal in uh, 
United States because he was, she was considered to be a supporter of bin Laden. Actually, Abdel Azam studied with him and uh, he was considered to be a supporter of radical Islamic, radic is supporting terrorists. He was, he was. Uh, in 2004, he was invited by Johnson, that was a mayor of London city, to be his guest. And he got... Boris Johnson. Yes, this was a, just uh, was prime minister. Mm -hmm. And after criticism, how come that you are inviting this uh, terrorist supporter, uh, they opened the discussion to a journalist party mm -hmm. to present uh, Sheikh El Kardawi, and then he presented himself as the one... A press conference, not a journalist. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the one that's supporting uh, the Islamic tolerance. And the main issue is, what is the truth? Either or, either he's lying or the truth. If he... So is he an Islamic moderate who just wants a loosey-goosey, nice jihad where everybody fulfills his inner, his inner struggle? Or is this, we want to kill the infidels, jihad? Exactly. And, and, so... and my answer is that he's both. Right. So uh, it is absolutely different form of thinking. He is both. The same about what you just offered. It is true. And if we are trying to understand the uh, strategical analysis in which they are thinking, and it is different from the way they led the military efforts in 1948, because that time they have been educated by estimation of situation according to British education okay. and Western education, and because they have been professional officers. They are thinking differently. They are thinking like that. We are sharing a dream to abolish, to destroy Israel. We are never coming to bring this dream to a negotiation. Nobody that is really true believer of Islam really a, a come to negotiate about a dream. So the dream is permanent. What we have regarding the dream, we are taking it seriously, and we are rational. The fact that today, for example, we cannot come to do something in order to bring the dream to be re a, a reality, it is due to circumstances. It means that they have a concept in Islam called a marhalat al istadaf. It means stage of weakness. It means God not supporting me in the way I am expecting. Today, uh, the will of God is that I realize my weakness. It means what I have to do to be patient, what is called in Arabic, sabr. The same is exemplified in Ramadan. I want to eat a whole day. I'm in the desert. It is hot. And I'm really making a training of what is called sabr, the patient, to carry the sufferness with a dedication and to succeed to come to the end. And then I'm carry this, carrying the sufferness, the suffering, the suffering, and then I am waiting to a new day. And then maybe tomorrow will come my day. So the dream will be fulfilled, if not today, tomorrow. See, that's how, I mean, Put it this way, there there was in the past a Western civilization and a Western way of war and a Western way of life and also a Jewish Western way of life, which was also able to postpone gratification and to believe that if you work hard and you invest in the future and you play by the rules, whatever they are, um, that you are also going to be able to get to a point uh, where you can, if not rest, then at least, you know, you've reached something. You've built something. You have a house. And you have a family. What? It goes... It's linear. But, but, the, but, the third, but today, you see, in the West, in Israeli, especially on the Israeli left, you have this impatience. You don't have that concept that if we... You know, like the old fable about the uh, 
the grasshopper and the and the ants, right? And the ants were preparing for yeah. winter, and the and the grasshopper was not, and he was playing outside, and then he died, and they yeah. all survived. And and here, you know, if if we're facing an enemy that will never be exhausted by the struggle, the struggle defines him, and so every day he's getting up. And he's checking to see where the Jews are. And so he can see, you know, where Yair Lapid comes up to Netanyahu and he says, we support you. Five minutes later, of course, he says it's time to end it. But he said that we support you. Benny Gantz said that he supports. But then he sees that the the um, the left continues out on Kaplan Street, blocking traffic, holding PLO flags, you know, whatever. the So, I mean, he he's he may outlive us. You know what I mean? Like if we can't, he's giving us a challenge that isn't just military, right? I mean, he's giving us a challenge that's spiritual, that's saying, okay, we're putting our civilization against your civilization. We're in jihad with you right now because we believe that you're the weaker horse. We believe that you're falling apart. You support the United States. The United States, you know, has has drag queens as admiral admirals in the U.S. Navy. You know, you... You're in trouble, and we're not. And so I agree. Even if I can uh, uh, win the marathon and be absolutely exhausted after, they can continue after. So we will win, really. If we are looking at the struggle as a permanent struggle, therefore the basic premises regarding uh, the conflict are coming to really be wrong, because uh, if we are judging the whole conflict from a Western cultural uh, cluster of values, then we are coming to be wrong, even regarding jihad. People uh, that are Westerns coming to Gaza, even the uh, workers coming from Gaza, I know one of them, walking with uh, a friend of mine, he's really a nice guy. And it is really... Kardawi, he's no, moderate. He is really... <laughs> and he doesn't support... I, I, I look for some struggle, except that he does. An ironical anecdote. He's no. looking... Uh, he, he has a... How it's called? Mashtela. Oh, he has a greenhouse. Yeah, and uh, a lady came to buy a nice uh, plant, and she asked him to help her to cover it uh, with the nylon, and uh, she... Uh, and she, she was asked to bring her the the knife, to bring him the knife to cut uh, the nylon. So he's walking with her with a very, very sharp knife and he's from Gaza and no one really worried about it. So the main idea to analyze it from Western perspective is, look, most of them are ordinary person. Most of them just expecting good life, deliver them good life, and then stability will come to the region. Right, that's the whole concept of the economic peace. This is what uh, I'm always repeating, that example that I, um, we, in a meeting in the Pentagon with the uh, first our general responsible to the Mediterranean desk, he told me and the cadets of National Defense College, at the end, everyone, everyone in the world wants the same. And one, what everyone wants, kids are going to school in security, restaurants are open. What George Bush said. That is what Barack Obama said. You That's know, what Joe Biden said. By speaking like that, not down from that beginning to understand Bin Laden, you are not beginning to understand me and Ben Gurion. Because if we just want kids going to school in security and restaurants, good restaurants, uh, going uh, open to midnight, why not just to struggle for that more than 100 years in Israel? Why not to come to New Jersey, to California? Is better. I more more st uh, stability. We can get more secured. We can get better life in a way. So, if you are trying to understand my struggle by saying everyone wants the same, it is disconfirmed. You, it means by just asking if you are beginning to get understanding, a deep understanding. So, what it means, just speaking again about jihad. They are realizing, they realize that from the time of Muhammad, that most of people are ordinary. Most of people, including Islamic people, really expecting good life, really, really worried about our children. 
not want to die, but not everyone is going to jihad. But if, as an ordinary person, coming at morning to work to bring food to my family, I just gave a bed to someone going at morning to jihad, I get part of the, his contribution to jihad. It means it is combined. Most of people are not directly activists in the jihad, but they are really part of the whole system. So, okay, we have systems too, and, and, the, and we're not bringing them to bear, and that goes to the other aspect, which is that, yes, we do have an incredibly powerful military, such as, it's obviously with limitations, everybody has limitations on their power, but, but we have... Thanks, God. Right, but, but we have a very strong military. And yet, you know, when we look at a, a, an irregular force against us, and all the forces against us are in one way or another quite irregular. I mean, no ground forces, missile forces, the Air Force are drones. They're not fifth generation fighter jets and all the rest of it. It's not, we're not facing an enemy that looks like us. So we, the reasonable thing to do if you wanted to win seems to me would be to say, okay, yeah, you have 150,000 missiles, you Hezbollah, and we have really, really, really big bombs, and we're going to go in now. Why wait for you to attack us? And we're just going to crush you, and all of your missiles are going to go away, and we're just going to vaporize them because we can't without nuclear weapons. We have the fighter power to go in and just blow it all up. Same thing with Hamas. I mean, Everybody laughs, says, well, we're going to turn uh, Gaza into a parking lot. Well, ostensibly we could, but we're not doing that. And instead of doing we need that, a legitimation, we need why. Why? Because why? Why? Why do we? That that was the next question, because, I mean, we could do, I, I could go back, you know, all the bar talk, right? Oh, we're just going to do this. We're just going to. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why don't we do that? Why? What is legitimacy here? Why do why do people like them who, you know, have their four-year-olds dancing around their, their rocket uh, launchers so that we won't attack them. And they're trying to force us to make this critical moral distinction and, and, and endanger our four-year-olds. Why are they uh, more legitimate than we are? Why, why do we think that we need to protect their four-year-olds before we protect our own? What happened to us? It is a, a Jewish defect. It's Jewish? I think it's Western also, but, wh but, uh, but the, what? But what? The, uh, I don't want to be anti-Semitic. No, 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 but, but I'm the, trying to the understand. Jewish people are really leading the whole Western cultural defect. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why don't, but then why bother, then why do we claim that we're strong? Aren't we weaker? We, we are in, we are under deep tension. And Ben Gurion realized that because if you're just analyzing the main conflict in the Western culture regarding use of power, there are imp a conflict regarding the use of power. Therefore, uh, Putin is so important because he's challenging the West. Uh, they had a dream and believe that they can achieve this dream, that they can create paradise in uh, real life. And what happened in Europe now is to bring even people in Denmark and Germany uh, to ask again the question regarding paradise in uh, real uh, personal life, and it is uh, just an illusion. So the way in which, from the beginning of Zionism, we tried to build a kind of paradise uh, guided by what is called Judeo-Christian or, or uh, values means that we have a conflict about using power. And if we are even looking backward to the translation of the Bible by Luther to Germany, that I can, I, I, I had no access to the first translation to Old Greek of the Bible. Words like Adonai Yishmil Hama, a God is a Lord of War, he, he just bypassed them, because if Lord, the God, is full of mercy, 
how we can call it uh, called him a, a, a lord of war we were just it's talking about it. we were just talking about that in the in the uh in the amida in the blessing that we say um uh we say that God is he's also with also and he also has terrible. revenge right yeah, it's also terrible so 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 how do you this is a Judaism the biblical Judaism is um perceived by Christian approach as a a primitive version right regarding to the new version of the New Testament so it is a new it's a new God. Yeah. He's all nice. <laughs> yeah, for they have the whole problem of what is called Theodetia, to justify God, because he's absolutely almighty God, uh, and with all power, and yet there is so much evilness in the world, how we can justify this God if he's just good, full with mercy? So maybe he's not. This is a Western cultural dilemma, not Islamic dilemma and not biblical dilemma. Once I told the uh, Professor David Hartman that he's so proud to belong to Judeo-Christian orientation, I told him that I realize that I'm belonging much more to Judeo-Islamic orientation. <laughs> the Bible is much closer to, to the, the Islamic orientation than to the Christian uh, approach to life, to reality. Mm -hmm. And he said, of course you have a point, but, of, uh, but absolutely I'll but my donors won't accept it. <laughs> That's really what he wanted to say. He wanted to say, but my donors... So actually we have a tension, unsolved tension, and it's making a strength and also weakness. And therefore we need legitimation, first of all, inner legitimation, and of course legitimation in support of Jewish people in the United States. And their main uh, claims against the whole a Zionistic pro uh, uh, project is, look, if the price in order to bring redemption is that we will be committed to be involved in an ongoing war, we don't want it. Well, that's what we need to do, though, right? So we're in a we're in a set of paradox. We're in a quandary, right? Because you say that you need the legitimacy of of X, Y, and Z, whoever they are at any particular moment. Um, and uh, in order to get it, um, you have to commit suicide because, and because your enemy point. is unrelenting. Fantastic. And here I have a point. The way that we can explain why that last operation was dedicated to attack only the Jihad Islamic uh, Palestinian group due to the fact that to attack them, considered to be legitimate. So we, uh, and actually it happened in the last week, uh, by, analyzing, by analyzing the reaction in Europe and the in United States, they could sustain it. Maybe because they are, actually the Americans are doing the same to ISIS. They are killing the leaders of ISIS, so we are doing the same. How you can criticize us? Well, they've done that for years. They've criticized yeah. us for doing the exact same thing that they do. They haven't had a problem with that. But here for a week, they gave us, they gave us, they gave us a carte blanche. I mean, they blocked the Security Council from having an anti-Israel decision. I think last two because it was managed like a brain a micro chirurgical surgery. Therefore, they could maintain it. But did we do anything? What did we accomplish vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hamas, vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah by doing this? What it, and this gets back to the now empty, how, hollow how, term I, I, deterrence. How do we need to estimate it? Absolutely. Because deterrence, if you are analyzing the way Anwar Sadat was deterred by Israeli superiority, actually he was deterred before 1973, but we want deterrence to prevent him from going to war. What happened with the absolute Israeli superiority in Air Force and in armor capabilities was that he recognized his inferiority and built a very creative form of a campaign directed to the awareness that he is inferior regarding 
is really Elsa priority. And by that, he brought a very successful campaign. It means instead of deter him from opening a war, he deter him in such a way that uh, compelled him to bring a very new creative idea of warfare. Which crushed us. Yes. So or the deterrence uh, was just an, a, a kind of acceleration for him, for creativity. And what about what happened last week? If you were, if you were, um, what's his name, uh, Sarsour, right? Uh, the, the head of uh, Hamas in Gaza. And you're looking at what just happened. What are you? What do you think he's looking at? What do you think he's he's thinking about when he looks at what happened last week? Of course, he's contemplating that together with Muhammad Def, his chief of staff. Right. They already realized in the last campaign uh, two years ago, in May two years ago, that we achieved technology to destroy them in the tunnels underground. We achieve technology to detect them by trying to penetrate the Israeli territory in tunnels. They recognize that even uh, their position in their war rooms, well protected in the tunnels, is dangerous. Tunnels. Mm -hmm. And after that, they are in a moment of free consideration regarding their way to attack us. Not only to attack us, but uh, uh, even uh, if they don't want to get a victory, just to lead a new attrition warfare, they are just in a, a moment, at the moment that they are finding it, trying to find a new way to do it. Well, they did in 2021. They used Israeli Arab citizens, right? I mean, that that was what they did. Absolutely. They, they moved to a oh, new it, it direction. was very clever because at uh, the moment that chief, Israeli chief of staff, Kuchavi, succeeded to bring artificial intelligence uh, 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 to overcome all difficulties and to find them everywhere, and it was an extraordinary achievement of a... Uh, a, a great technological oriented warfare, he brought us back in uh, uh, Israeli cities, in Lod, in Jaffa, in Arabo, uh, in Jerusalem, the uh, age of stone to the age of fire, just by lightening synagogues, by uh, destroying uh, apartments of Jews. And businesses and cars. And couldn't recognize the whole threat because we have been so much oriented to the realization and to the Israeli uh, self-appreciation uh, of ourselves that we are at the moment of information age, not anymore right. industrial age. We're speaking about the of a grum age. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. So I guess the last question, because I don't want to keep you too long. Um, all right, so we're in the age of pogroms. We're in the we're in we're in the I don't know uh, age of AI in terms of IDF capabilities, and we're fighting uh, a Neanderthal force that uses torches uh, and rocks and and daggers to attack Israeli women and, and children and, and 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 to ram families. Um, so. Uh, Green Kalachnikov rifles to massacre women and, and daughters while they're driving on the highway, of course. So, I mean, they, they do, they got it all too. They have rockets and mortars and missiles on the one hand, and then they have clubs and, and they use them all in the relevant places for them, right? I mean, you, you use the right weapons in the right areas, but Israel has not, um, we may continue to innovate in our technology, but we haven't developed a proper or, or response at all uh, for for the cavemen, right? I mean, so yes. so where do you think we are in this? They are changing all the time. We are actually uh, 
So Ismail Sarsour, I think that's his name, or Ibrahim Sarsour and Mohammed Def sitting in Gaza, seeing what happened to Islamic Jihad. Did they learn anything that they didn't know about? Maybe it's in well as well. Uh, well, all of the, the whole the whole Politburo of jihadists. So they're they're all sitting there trying. To, did they learn anything new here? Did they not learn anything new? Did they learn anything helpful from our perspective? It, okay, the main question is what we must learn. Yet we are under obstacle uh, to to say just to stand by facing reality and to admit that we must get rid of our dreams. What it means, get rid from our dreams that uh, tomorrow we will have a, a great uh, peace here, stability, well, just with Israeli uh, economical uh, prosperity. We will show that prosperity with everyone. Yes, I'm living among Arabs in the Galil and they are aware about the prosperity, they really like want, it. They like it, they want to share it, they are living in prosperity, they have a lot of money today. But speaking about the Jews in Israel, they are yet preventing themselves from their, their necessary awareness that we must come to a consciousness of struggle. It happened actually to Ben Gurion in 1936. Before 1936, he made effort to speak with the Arab leaders to come to a common denominator to convince them that we are bringing prosperity to the region. Why not to share with us uh, the whole activity? By entering to all this uh, re Arab rebellion in 1936 to 1939, he deeply came to the awareness that no chance and what we must concentrate in order to achieve our dreams is to build, to plant, to build more uh, settlements, to bring more Jews, not immigrants, Olim. Mm -hmm. There is a huge difference between being an immigrant and being an Ole, a Ole of Kibbutz Galuyot, a regathering. Ingathering of exiles. Yes. And it means that what is so necessary now, even more important than to build the national guard, it is necessary, but more important is to bring the Israeli people back to this awareness that we are under struggle and we are living in an era of struggle. And we must be united in that struggle. Uh, and of course, there are people that not fitting to them this idea, but the main problem is our politicians that I'll just aware, read you a, you know, they are just aware that they will not succeed to get a, a elected a victory in the election if they will come with uh, my message. You know, I just I I'm working on a book on the Israeli left now, and I and and I as I was driving in Jerusalem, I remembered that infamous statement that Ehud Olmert, who we started with and we can end with here, he said in June 2005, right before the expulsions from Gaza, he gave a speech to a group of American uh, uh, progressives from the Is Is Israeli Policy Forum. Um, and he said to them famously, and you don't need to be reminded of this, he said, we are tired of fighting. We are tired of being courageous. We are tired of winning. We are tired of, defe of defeating our enemies. We want to be able to live in an entirely different environment of relations with our enemies. But you don't get to decide that. I think that that was that was two months before the expulsions from Gaza. He makes this statement. And I guess, you know, he he may have just drunk his own Kool-Aid. He might, might have believed the lies, right, that that Gaza was going to become Singapore. They were going to get our greenhouses and they were going to you know, be happy farmers and and and, oh, great. and 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 everything was going to be fun. Due to the fact that you participated with me in the disengagement, you didn't share that uh, war game that I participated with. Yet uh, it was the chief of staff, Boogie Alone. It was April two thousand five to try to play out what would happen. And uh, uh, that war game, I told them, listen, go to Sharon, told him, I tell him that. In all our war games, we are realizing that we will not have 
and to an, an adaptable response to the potential of threat that will emerge after the disengagement because we will not have legitimacy to uh, uh, just bomb with artillery shells uh, a refugee camp like Jabalia with 50,000 residents who will not be able to carry every... Let's turn Gaza into a uh, parking uh, lot. Like second uh, week to an invasion to Bet Hanul that it is five minutes uh, from Ashkelon. Right. We will not be able because we will have a lot, a lot of reasons why not now, why to delay it, why it is illegitimate now. So can to inform him that what he's doing is irresponsible regarding the uh, future of Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of a uh, chief of staff, this one that was still stiff, chief of staff, Boogie, Yalon, and Dan the next was Dan Kaut, he warned me that I'm speaking absolutely uh, by political ideas that I'm not allowed to speak like that. I told them, listen, among all of you, I'm the only one speaking professionally regarding professional military attitude. So it's interesting here. This this quote is so sick, right? Because it's so it it is the exact response to the, the people snickering at the Hamas in 2005, saying God is moving our missiles away from the Jews. Bowling, we can just go ahead and speak. What therefore it is. A, really uh, relevant what we is just contemplated before about Abdel Azam. Why he is relevant to our discussion? Because at the moment we are struggling with enemies guided by religious motivation. They are trusting God. Therefore, they can be able to uh, overcome permanent struggle. Even uh, religious Jewish people that I know a lot of them are hesitating to bring the trust of God into the estimation of the, uh, practical estimation. It's of not faith. trust of God, though. I mean, it, it there it's faith. It there's a different. Yeah, I, 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 it's, I, I, it's, I it's not that God's going to save us. It's that you know um, he, that the things that you can't. Explain to yourself. It's the idea of what is an explanation. Even as I go into the valley of death, I, I will. And you know, he was speaking with a, a rational uh, professor like uh, Professor Leibovitch. He will immediately uh, warn us listen, this is a, a valley of death. Don't enter. He is irrational, irresponsible to enter. What David, uh, uh, that. He sums that was written by him telling us there are moments in which the best rationality is to dare to enter to that thing. You know, I, I, I'm just going to end this with this. I, I or, or you, you, with your response to this, but I got into trouble on Twitter when a couple of weeks ago, right at sort of the crunch time for the judicial reform before uh, Netanyahu decided that he was going to just put it on on the back burner and and go to the the um mm-hmm. president so i gave the example of what happened with the uh, soldiers in golani and wadi saluki right so that they they are they have a fireball coming at them and the people on the radio were telling them to run away and everybody who tried to run away from the fire was burned, and the only people who survived were the, the ones stayed. who dro- who ran through it. That 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 was the only way because it was this very rapidly advancing fire, and either you were going to be consumed by it or you're going to get through it. Yeah. And so everybody yelled at me, and and you know that that the, and still today I see this. this is several weeks ago, and people are demonizing me because I was talking about running into fire, and and I'm and I'm. Uh, uh, besmirching the memory of the of the fall, which is exactly the opposite of what I. Anyway, um, the point is that you know sometimes when you're faced with adverse situations, the only way that you can surpass them is to go through them, right? I mean, and and here what we have in the West and what we're seeing in the general staff of the IDF and in our leftist elite here 
is this is this embrace of denialism as a as the basis for national strategy because they don't want to believe the difficult things about oui, the but nature. Therefore, of- I'll come back to emphasize the difference between trust and faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, why uh, the Lubavitcher, the rabbi, gave dollar? He said that it is. He gave every the the rebbe from Lubavitch. In case you guys aren't aware, everybody who came to visit him. He gave him a dollar. Yes, and he said it is written in God we trust. Why trust is better in his considerations than in God we believe or in God we have faith? Because faith and belief is a concept for theological seminar. For example, in the book of Rabbi Soloveitchik, the person of faith, it is the lonely man of faith. The, the lonely man of faith. Uh-huh. A, not really bringing me to take God to practical reasoning. A Moroccan Jewish lady just bringing a, a sac Yeah, who's, who's, who's putting her laundry out to dry yes, in the morning. Yes, she's uh, just detecting, lo- looking to the sky and the uh, clouds are coming. She's speaking directly with God, telling him, please consider me. I walk so hard, please wait with the rain. <laughs> this is not... A, a, an example of faith, it is an example of trust. Therefore, so, I'm with that lady and not with Soloveitchik. I'm trusting God. He's in, he, he, he's taking pra- a part in my practical reasoning. Okay. All right. Well, I think, so if, if we are, should I sum it all up? I mean, I guess, so last week we had an exchange of fire with people who are guided by reality, uh, inspired by a, a faith or trust in Allah, who believe that they are on the road of jihad towards the annihilation of Israel. And we, and we had a, it, we came into confrontation with them. And everybody's telling themselves a story about what just happened, right? Um, is our story credible? What we're telling ourselves, we beat them back. We must, this was important. This was real for it. This is that our leaders today cannot uh, come to lead us only by excellency of management. But they did a good job. Yeah, they must come with spiritual, a spiritual leadership. They must tell a new story for the ongoing a Jewish redemption here in that holy land. All right. Well, I I, I agree with you. I, I, so, what can we do? Because we're both people of faith, so we we understand that the we, you don't have to laugh at the Hamasnik who, who no, said I'm that. I'm really respecting them, really, because they they saw a phenomenon, and maybe you don't like their explanation, but they at least were living in a world where they're paying attention to it. And what we're seeing on, on our side is is much less willingness to even countenance what they're seeing. All right. Well, Gershon, thank you so much for joining me. Major General Gershon Cohen, my old friend, thank you so much. And we'll see you guys again next week for another incredibly important and interesting discussion here on the Carolyn Glick Show. And don't forget to subscribe to all the channels, JNS, Carolyn Glick Show, Rumble, YouTube, you name it. But be here next week. Take care.